it's my honor and privilege to welcome you to the weekly Saturday webinar where we bring you every 6 p.m. on every Saturday, we bring you nation builders, people who built institutions and through institution building, they have contributed to nation building because these institutions stand tall, post they've relinquished their leadership. Uh, these institutions provide huge amount of, you know, employment, they are bulwarks of the Indian economy and in some way they are bellwether stocks. So today we are, last week in our inaugural episode, we spoke to Sri D.V. Kapoor, who is the doyen of the Indian industry. He's 92 and uh, um, he really talked to us about how project management can solve uh, the problems of the economy, how project management can be the panacea for all ills. Today we have an equally accomplished uh, leader with us. Uh, he really doesn't need an introduction. But let me welcome Sri S.K. Rungta, who is the former chairman of the Steel Authority of India Limited, to this second edition of the Nation Builders. Welcome, Sri S.K. Rungta. We are delighted that you are talking to BW Business World. Uh, let me formally introduce you uh, to the audience. Uh, uh, Mr. S.K. Rungta, from 2006 to 2010, was the chairman of the Steel Authority of India Limited. Uh, and I don't have to tell you that Sale is among the largest uh, public sector companies in India. He's an alumnus of the Bits Pilani and of the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. Uh, he's, been the, he's been the president of the Institute for Small Development and Growth, of, of Steel Development and Growth. He's also been the first chairman of the International Coal Ventures Limited, a JV of li, li, five leading PSUs, including Sale, Coal India Limited, RINL, NMDC, and NTPC. He was a member of the various Apex chambers. He was the chairman of the Steel Committee of FICI, member of the National Council of CII, and advisory council of SHM. Mr. Rungta was also the president of the Institute for Steel Development and Growth, as I mentioned. He is presently a mentor of the Non Ferrous Metal Committee at FICI. Mr. Rungta was also a member of the Executive Committee of the World Steel Association, the apex body for formulation for policy of world steel. I can go on. Uh, I can only say that under his leadership, SAIL achieved new landmarks in physical and financial performance operating at 115 percent of its rated capacity it had posted a pbt of of over rupees 9400 crores in the year fy09 and emerged as the second highest net profit among all steel producer of the world uh, mr runta has been and continues to be director of multiple corporate boards he's also associated with educational institute and non-profit organization he was chairman of the board of governors of iit bhavneshwar welcome mr runta what an illustrious career you had and we're delighted again to welcome you to the second edition of the Nation Builders. This is being streamed, uh, streamed live on businessworld.in or you can watch it on the social media handles, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn of Business World. Let me start by asking Mr. Runta, who's clearly the steel man of India or the metal man of India, if I had to say that. Uh, Mr. Runta, how have been the last 17 months for you, both personally and professionally, given that we were dealing with COVID? So, good evening Anurag. At the outset, I would like to convey my grateful thanks for having me this evening on your show. Now, responding to your question on the last 17 months, I suppose it has been a very, very unprecedented period and foreseen. The world has changed. Our lives have changed in many ways. It won't be an exaggeration to say that there was a world before COVID and there is a world after COVID. Now, on professional front, I suppose uh, after initial shock and uncertainty, uh, organizations have responded very well in terms of uh, resilience, in terms of adaptability. They have tried to be more agile in their functions, be it supply chain, technology, uh, marketing, HR practices, logistics. and. I think, uh, leave aside the government, if you talk of the uh, industry, organizations, uh, citizens of the country and other social organizations, I suppose we have responded well in, to the situation and there were many actions which were taken which really were the need of the hours. Talking to uh, professional uh, life for me in person, uh, I found that uh, during this period, my boardroom engagement was more lively and more informative 
and uh, certainly there were more learning for me i could uh, connect with uh, trade bodies and industry associations and other uh, related bodies more through virtual mode and definitely there were a lot of learning for me uh, by connecting to different set of people on the personal front i would say that uh, well it has brought in uh, much more discipline in my daily routine including my dietary habits and uh, i have been able to connect with some old friends after a lot of gap though virtually i could spend uh, you know quality time with my grandchildren which i was not able to do earlier enough and above all i think i have been i have been able to shed my fear of technology in my day to day operations thanks to mentoring and guidance of my granddaughter dia she was my guide and teacher in this regard and that has been quite helpful for me so on the whole in spite of some periods of anxiety i suppose on the whole my experience has been positive and i am looking forward with the positive aspect of this thank you mr rungta they say uh, it's your own outlook what you make of situation you are there are things that you can control and the things you can't control you can only control what you uh, which is in your direct uh, influence now let me ask you before we get into nation building project management institution building economy uh, how do you the, re- the response of the nation to covid and when i say nation i'm not just speaking of the government government is an important stakeholder i'm talking of society i'm talking of individuals i'm talking of the industry i'm talking of healthcare so give us a sense of how do you see the response and i want a very honest answer from you yeah so i'll try to give you the honest answer you know let's consider the fact that we are such a large nation with so much of diversity in terms of languages religions you know our food habits and with complex problems you know we have so many states which are governed by a different set of political parties so you know by any standards we are a, a complex complexly governed nation so considering that aspect i suppose in retrospect if i look back i will rate our response as a nation on the whole satisfactory and uh, especially initially yes we were in a state of shock because it was a totally uncharted territory nobody knew that how to respond in fact we didn't have the basics like uh, sanitizer sanitizers or even masks or pp kits uh, you know historically our health services have been grossly inadequate i think beyond the big cities and even beyond the district headquarters virtually they are non existent even in district headquarters uh, many places they are in shambles or not to the adequate uh, requirement of the uh, society so it took little time for society to respond but thereafter i think we responded well in terms of adaptability our uh, entrepreneurs you know came back they could quickly improvise and you know with the same plant and capacity could at least manufacture some of these basic requirements to fight covid like sanitizers masks pp kits and other uh, critical equipments for healthcare uh, i must say that our healthcare workers uh, did very well to respond to the situation because there were no treatment protocol and uh, you know they were after all uh, trying in uh, uncertain or uncharted territory without really any treatment protocol but still they did their best at the personal uh, you know hazard and, and at that time nobody knew that how covid will behave so it was so much of a fear in the society that if our health workers really responded it goes to their credit and let me say that you talked about government but 
generally it is believed that you know government setup is very inefficient lazy they take a lot of time to respond but uh, if you see the manner in which our law enforcement agencies uh, including police you know they were on the street enforcing laws uh, there could be some excesses or there could be some lacuna but on the whole they did their duties well our safai karmacharis did their duties well other utilities railways their their employees also did their duties well so i won't say that uh, you know we didn't respond well or uh, i think even government services to the extent they were running they were running well with the employees doing their call of duty even society i think responded beyond the call of duty uh, initially there were the issue of uh, you know providing food to many uh, you know set of families uh, maybe you know there were hardships especially for the labor which were migrant labor but i know that many of the organizations much beyond the established ngos i think individuals really came forward to extend the helping hand and that uh, shows that yes as a nation we are sensitive we are sensitive to our other fellow beings in the society and that was a positive thing of course we had the second wave which was a much more devastating uh, probably by hindsight we can say that we should have been much better prepared should have prepared our medical system much better because by then we had some clue as to how things are to be tackled but those are the lessons which we can learn by hindsight and if uh, those lessons are learned well and we correct ourselves then i suppose this will be a good response so on the whole i would say that our system worked well our technology worked well digital technology worked well which really helped in uh, you know this work from home and there was good adaptability by the organizations including corporates and uh, there was good synergy all around now in this situation if we can really learn some lessons and uh, you know sort of create our health infrastructure and education infrastructure for uh, universal masses on a long term basis then i suppose We, it can be taken that we have converted this challenge into an opportunity and that's that's what is the challenge before the nation and i suppose we should live up to this challenge so that we have long term positives coming out of this uh, challenge thank you so much mr rungta for being a pragmatist and a realist at the same time or looking at what went right and what could have been better now clearly in any crisis what matters is leadership when it comes to the nation when it comes to institutions when it comes to corporates uh, leadership matter now leadership traits uh, across the years have stayed the same the universal truth still apply but tell me um, what are the traits of leadership that are required in this environment to build institutions how does one uh, and you've done it as a leader you've done it as a chairman of sale how does one build institutions that last one sir so you know leadership traits you know there is academic or uh, experts have defined so many traits in a leader uh, to build good institutions you know you can call it that he should have vision and passion he should build a strong culture conducive in the environment for realization of potential of the team putting right people in right places um empowerment and enablement and so on and so forth you know you, you can uh, go on expanding the list as far as institution building is concerned but i would like to talk with regard to my experience as a practicing manager in building uh, organization or institution as to what have been the leadership traits which i felt really stood me well and really i could uh, accomplish with the help of my team some of the goals and tasks which we had set for ourselves so i'll just enumerate a few of them i think firstly 
for a leader he should not have any duality you know is whatever he is inside or should be outside you know his team should perceive that you know he is you know walking the talk whatever he is saying he should mean it uh, so that means it's a question of building trust so he has to trust his team and the team has to trust his fairness this is the paramount importance uh, for any leader to carry his team along and get the best out of it secondly i suppose any leader to bring an you know to bring up any institution it is very important that he should have vision passion and he should be able to think big because unless we really think big then uh, we cannot accomplish you know the our boundaries are what we are able to think obviously we cannot accomplish anything beyond what we are able to think so if uh, we ourselves set constraints we have doubts and we start feeling that this is possible not possible if we have our thought process itself is mediocre and we don't go thinking big then where is the question of accomplishing any big or building great institutions now you know everybody say that you know biggest resource is people and whoever you talk to they will say that you know materials machine money doesn't matter what matters is the people and uh, you know great organizations are built by the people so i think it is easier talked but then you know question is that how do you really convert in the real sense people into your great resources that is most important and here i said that it is the job of the leader to really create an conducive environment where you can build trust where you can really uh, nurture the talent you put people at ease they should feel that yes here is a professional setup if we if we work hard and deliver we will get recognition if we don't do that then obviously we are found wanting so i think it is very very important to make a professional assessment of your team and then put the right people in right place it is important that every person is afforded conducive environment and opportunity to realize his potential there are many people who are good at certain type of jobs but they cannot do a good job if they are put in a wrong place so it is the job of leader to really see that he he finds right potential uh, for the right job and puts people in right places and I, when i was talking of uh, you know uh, objectivity in the assessment because ultimately we have to see that uh, organizations uh, goals are aligned with people's aspirations and growth plans and as long as the team feels that leader means business he is objective in his assessment he is fair to everybody then i think lot of things can fall in place other thing may look small but uh, i will say that a leader should not have any ego or pettiness i'll just give you an example my personal uh, experience you know in uh, at one time we had brought out a promotion list in sale from general manager to executive director that is the highest level we could, you know a cmd is allowed to promote after that there are directors which government appoints so after the list was out a very senior officer came to me and said okay sir how have you included person x in this uh, promotion list i said why anything wrong he said no no because i am saying this because that person is uh, not very favorably disposed or towards you sometimes he makes some charitable remarks against the chairman so i was surprised that you have promoted him i said uh, okay leave this part aside you tell me is there anything else wrong with that person based upon his work should he have deserved this promotion or should he shouldn't have deserved he said yes he is pretty good in his work and the best one is what yes probably you could have promoted him i said fine then i told him that just think that even if i am a most popular chairman of the company 
my approval rating probably will not be more than 90% even if i am very very popular so if the, if i my job is if i start tracking that balanced 10% what are they saying about me what are they doing about me or uh, you know what are their comments then i will be doing only that job forget about sale and you know any uh, accomplishment by sale and that's all i will be in that rut so i don't want to get into that and it is his job as long as he has not developed a, so much of a hatred for me that even uh, you know to pull me down he will do the organization's damage is fine for me so the lesson for me was that a leader has to keep organization ahead of his personal interests so that is something which i feel uh, is very important even the ego i talked about ego i'll tell you another example that we had a very very uh, important case of you know mining allocation which have been pending for 20 years and i was pursuing with lot of vigor and i had told my team that you pursue this uh, file from desk to desk so when there was no progress for about a month i called the senior most of the team i said what why there is no progress so he said there is one some junior officer he has some reservation and he is not putting up the file further that's why it is stuck so i said okay come with me tomorrow next day although he was a very very junior officer junior most in the government i went to his desk and i didn't say anything about the file i simply said that well you are a very knowledgeable officer and generally my team is uh praising you that yes uh, you know your job well and i thought i'll just say hello to you and uh, you know my file got cleared in next two three days so if i was sitting on a ego that well if this fellow is not doing let me go to secretary or minister and then try to do probably there could have been some difficulty so just uh, you know a simple example but i feel that it is important that leader doesn't stand on ego as far as uh, you know organizational interest are concerned and i talked about enabling environment uh for people to give in their best again i would like to cite a small example of sale so when i took over as cmd then i told our plant heads we had five integrated steel plants i said you start tracking the best innovation in your plant on a daily basis and just send me a mail as to what was your best innovation on that day previous day irrespective of level it could be at the lowest worker level or it could be at the executive director level or it could be an individual effort or it could be group effort and then i started getting reports very wonderful initiatives at individual levels including at group levels and then many of the managing directors told me ki sir it has been eye opener for us we didn't know that many of our employees were capable of this kind of initiatives on their own without really any incentive being given by the company without getting recognized they were doing through self motivation and we really then created this as a movement and all that i had done to really uh, motivate them was that whenever i used to go to plant i used to call such individuals and groups just for a cup of tea with their families which was a great and kind a of motivation for them so i think uh, there are enough things which we can do in normal course so sorry so in normal course a leader has to build great institution so there are uh, academic uh, traits and there are certain things practical way you can do within the given academic traits but i suppose if he has sense of purpose he he is uh, he commands trust of his team he trust his team the and uh, he has put the right people in right places i am sure the leader can build a great institution i think i agree with most of it first you said don't have duality that means clarity of purpose and being able to communicate it well 
articulate it well and align everyone to it. Second, you talked about shared goals. Third, you talk about no ego. You know, fourth, you talk about put, putting people first. Fifth, you talk of competency. A lot of times we have this uh, syndrome of what colleagues say about us. We have to put the uh, and you know I can not help give you Nelson Mandela's example. He stayed in the jail for 25 years. When he came out, he pardoned all the people who had put him in jail. He said, I want to look forward. I don't want to look behind. I want to look ahead. And being able to forgive is a big trait of a leader. Only large-hearted leaders can forgive and move forward. Uh, so clearly, these are traits uh, or leadership that are required in terms of institution building. Now, let me get uh, deep into nation building in the institutional building. You understand the link between institution building and nation building. Give us, uh, why should people like you who have led organizations transform them? And we talked about the fact that in 2009, sale did almost 9,500 crores of PAC and uh, it was ranked by a US-based organization as the second best steel producer in the world, right? It wasn't the second largest, but not just the largest, but the best. We were the 18th largest in size, but we were at just as the second best steel producer. Also yeah. being 15th on size, yeah. Yeah. So, give us a sense of how can institution building lead to nation building? Give us that connect. So, Anurag, I think uh, nation cons- consists of, uh, you know, its people, institutions and, uh, you know, cumulative of all these things. So, there, there cannot be, a, you know, nation building without uh, its, you know, people, its uh, institutions. And they are integral part of any na- nation's progress. So, see, you know, after all, if we are looking at nation's progress, there are institutions within the government, there are institutions with private sector, there are social institutions, there are NGOs, there are, uh, you know, the, the private individuals. So, obviously, there is a very strong link uh, between institutions and, uh, you know, nation building. Now, let, uh, just think of it, uh, say, for, uh, you know, uh, steel needs of the country or the for building infrastructure in the country. We, we need steel, we need cement, we need so many other inputs uh, for our infrastructure. Now, if we don't have efficient institutions which can really provide that, like, uh, you know, sale, sale uh, prided itself not as a steel producer, but as a steel builder to the nation. That that was our punchline also, that there is a little bit of sale in everybody's life. That means we, we felt that, you know, we are not producing steel, but we are touching the lives of each and every, you know, Indian. So, institutions are integral part of the nation and only good institutions can really take forward a nation building process. Uh, you talked about project management. The institutions with strong project management can really, uh, you know, save a lot of money for the nation. They can really ensure that, you know, growth, uh, you know, uh, comes back fast. Uh, in fact, that has been one of our weak point that uh, our we have had time and cost overruns. Uh, in our project, uh, many of our projects, and if uh, good institutions are there who finish their projects in time, obviously it is a great effort for the nation. And if there are institutions with the very strong internal systems, I suppose they can impart it to the other institutions. And you know, one institution, you know, good institution can really lead to uh, multiple good institutions. It's not that, uh, you know, it works in a, as an island. You know, a good institution leads to uh, a replication of uh, many good practices, good institutions. So, obviously, that is a prerequisite that we have uh, good institutions, strong institutions, and that's why, you know, every day we talk about good institutions in terms of, uh, you know, every sphere of our activity not only manufacturing and industry, but we, we talk about uh, constitutional institutions, government institutions, uh, private institutions, NGOs, whatever it is. They are all integral part of the nation. And I think uh, it is very, very important that uh, institutions are uh, doing well for nation progress. 
Thank you for bringing out that connect. And now, especially talking about a journey at sale, how did you transform the organization? What were your key learnings? And again, you spent a lot of time in sale, right? So you understood the culture, you understood the processes, you understood the strengths of the organization. Give us a sense of uh, if you had to sum up in three to five minutes uh, the highlights of your journey at sale and what are the learnings in it for managers, entrepreneurs, and future leaders uh, in terms of nation building. Some of those you've already touched upon. But give us a sense of what were your top learnings and what, how were you able to achieve what you achieved? So, Anurag, uh, to talk about my journey in sale, you know, I spent uh, 38 long years in sale. I had joined uh, sale in 72 as a marketing activity. And, you know, at that time, I will just take a minute to explain my initial part of uh, my journey in sale, you know. I was put in a steel import division straight away on the job from the day one because I had come from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade and uh, at that time, uh, you know, steel import was penalized. So, industry had to import uh, steel through sale. They could not import it directly. They didn't have import license. So, I found that uh, from very first day that my knowledge about, you know, the sourcing of imports, the suppliers, the products was very sketchy even after, you know, a fortnight or a month. And the real information was with the users. They knew everything about their suppliers, about their source, about their products, their strengths and everything. Now, one of the very leading industries used to come to us every quarterly to finalize these orders in consultation with us to give his approval so that we could place orders and then he could get that steel. Now those were the you know time of uh, times of uh, uh, controls and uh, you know you will be surprised that uh, as a marketing executive I was not expected to meet any customer outside office. It could be uh, taken as a vigilance case that if I met any customer outside my office in his hotel or anything. But then I felt that my knowledge was not adequate and I must learn from these industries uh, through, you know, engagement and detailed discussion. That was not possible during a short visit to the office. So I went to my boss that, please permit me to meet Mr. X who has come to see me to finalize your order in his hotel in the evening. I want to learn about this business from him, that about sources of supply, everything, so that I can do my job efficiently. So he thought for a moment, he said, okay, you come to me in the afternoon. And he was a very pragmatic, good officer. He said, okay, I give you permission, but take the permission in writing. Because tomorrow, you know, something issue may arise, so you can say that you are taking my permission in writing. So I took his permission in writing and went and engaged with him. It was a very good session. I learned a lot from him. I remained in touch with him every time I got inputs. So this I am illustrating that from the very initial stage, I didn't feel that the boundaries which have been set, I should confine myself and I sh shouldn't really think of innovative ways to do something beyond the boundaries. And that's how I proceeded. One, one also intermediate stage came when I was asked to go to uh, Mumbai as regional manager marketing uh, when my children were in terminal years in Delhi. But then my boss told me that this is the time when we are facing stiff competition in Western region and I couldn't think of anybody else than you to go and you know, fit in that role. So I went despite some issues. And I, I must say that it was the most fulfilling uh, time professionally because what I could learn in Mumbai in the competition period, I couldn't have probably learned elsewhere. You know, there are many stories of that time, some other time I'll tell you. So that then uh, I had spent most of time marketing, I was director marketing. And then again, I got an opportunity offered by the company to be director HR with also in charge of uh, mining in the company, iron ore and coal, as well as business, business planning group of the company. And I 
took up that uh, offer very promptly i didn't feel that you know it is you know unknown territory why should i get into it whether i will perform better or not and i can tell you that i enjoyed most that one and a half years of time including six months charge as managing director of one of the plant it gave me 360 view degree view of all the operations of sale which really stood me well as chairman now as chairman i must say that again my basic philosophy of turn around was you know people i i had since i had grown with the company i had seen that you know our plants our people have tremendous potential and they have not really realized their potential fully my job was only to convince them that yes you have potential why don't you you know do more and uh, let me tell you that initially i had lot of resistance when we you know the very first business plan was discussed under my leadership i wanted very raised targets because i felt that we can do much better and obviously there was resistance you know people would say for this reason that reason we can't do it so i had to really tell our team because ultimately i didn't want to impose it i wanted to come this proposal from them so that it was a shared vision and shared target so i said why don't you take this target if you do that voluntarily and if you are able to achieve that you just experience the pleasure of you know achieving a stiff target rather than in your heart of heart you know that you are taking a very soft target and you do 102% it won't give you pleasure because you know that you took a soft target and uh, through deliberations communications we could create situation where people themselves came forward to say yes we will take this target and uh, you know that did the trick in many cases we could raise our production we could raise our productivity for us uh, one example i'll give you that one blast furnace in bokaro that will durgapur was performing much below its capacity when i went there i called the senior team so they gave me various reasons why we can't do it 100% i said okay please call the 10 workmen and their supervisor who are working in this blast furnace i only told them ki you have been with this blast furnace for so long you know x y z of this plant and blast furnace i want you to raise it to 3500 from 3000 can you do it so at least the workmen said sir we will try it so i said okay if you do it then i will come and sell it to uh, we can introduce a bell incentive scheme if you touch 3500 today next day you go with this kind of cash incentive very next day and uh, i can tell you uh, anurag that well we couldn't do 3500 but from 3000 we could reach 3400 so many of these things we did in our raw material division to produce Uh, quality raw materials in uh, our consultancy division in our uh, project management in uh, regard to our raw material security i was mentioning how we secured 500 million of i don't know rights including uh, uh, you know chidia mines which which is a very prized mine for sale to even today so basically it is the it was the people's game my job was only to convince them that their potential is more and my job was to put right people in right place one a small initiative i took that you know generally we have five integrated plants people are very comfortable at one location so they continued in one location throughout although they were very pleasant so i said uh, two two plant heads i called them i said give me your five top performing officers and i told them okay you switch both of them you know five your top five performing officer you give to another plant and another plant will give their top five performing officers to them two initially there was resistance but later on all of them came to me to tell ki sir thank you very much for that we were really our eyes were open when we went to another plant we had a lot and we really enjoyed new instant 
so these are the things you know you with good intention good sense of purpose involving the team if you do i think we can do a lot another aspect uh, which you can say that sale team was pretty good technically but i think uh, i it inculcated and sort of uh, encouraged them, them to be techno commercial because it's not good enough to be good engineer you should be uh, you know good businessman as well so that also helped so there were a lot of initiatives but i will give credit to the team they responded well my job was only as a catalyst and uh, we could do it during 2008 9 when the crisis was in the offing we could spot it uh, uh, some kind of problem i had gone to washington in world steel association meeting and i saw the body language of people was not very great you know in sometime in august 2008 came back reduced our stocks raw material stocks and uh, it, it took certain actions that we had the minimum inventory losses when the market fell greatly and that's how we did the you know second highest profit in the among the steel companies of the world during that that year so i would credit it to my the team my job was only to encourage them and take them along as my team. Uh, let's move to some larger lessons i have two questions first question is how does the steel economy mirror the r- real economy and how do you think at this point we can spur the indian economy what do you think uh, can be done to accelerate the economy from where we are so anurag as far as steel economy is concerned it is very much uh, mirroring the you know indian economy in general so for example it is a part of manufacturing sector and larger industry sector you know industry means mining and electricity included so you know apart from manufacturing sector you know steel is dependent upon mine for you know because for for their raw materials and consumes a lot of like electricity to produce steel so it can be taken as a part of industrial sector secondly there are a lot of services also associated with the industry in terms of logistics or you know it services automation services and uh, you know at moving equipments and other services handling so it is very much a part of uh, mirroring the economy in general i would say that if economy is performing on the strength of greater investment in infrastructure which is a steel intensive sector then steel will do better than the overall economy growth but if we are not doing well in steel intensive sector like infrastructure or construction then probably steel will lag behind the overall economy growth now look at china china has steel industry has grown much beyond their gdp growth because they did huge investment in their infrastructure in you know the previous 10 15 years even now they are doing a lot of investment in infrastructure and that's how their steel industry outgrew their economy in our case also you know between 2004 to 2007 8 when uh, we were building the infrastructure then uh, steel industry growth was 2 to 3 percent higher than the overall economy growth so but broadly it mirrors the overall economy growth uh depending upon the sectors where the intensity of investment uh, is there uh, you know the steel uh, intensity may vary as compared to the overall economic growth now so thank you now, now you be, you now, and you now addressing how the indian economy can be spurred yes that just one second now second part of your question related to how do we spurt the or how do we revive the economy so i i suppose for you know economy to revive one is the policy interventions and other is you know uh how how do we really see that uh, various sectors of the industry start firing so 
as far as the policy interventions are concerned i personally believe that government is making right noises right interventions in the regard to policy but uh, one lacuna which remains which is a national lacuna is that there is a gap between what we pronounce and what we are able to execute so i would for a moment say that instead of making more and more policy pronouncements i think it is for policy makers and as a nation as a whole we have to see that how do we really execute where what we have already set uh, target for ourselves and the real philip which can be given to the economy uh, and all sectors led to infrastructure which i was talking now government has done well in current year to you know set a target of more than 5 and 1/2 lakh crore for investment uh, which is uh, i think about 30 to 35 percent more than the last year now we have to see that that investment is put uh, you know in place it's it doesn't remain on paper because uh, you know it's a big multiplier any investment in infrastructure can lead to more consumption of steel cement uh, non ferrous metals uh, you know services towards uh, you know transportation handling earth moving equipments uh, not uh, glass so many areas plastics in terms of pipes so it touches lot of areas similarly housing and construction can also spur the economic activity to a great extent so i suppose we are seeing uh, signs of economic activity getting uh, strengthened uh, one good thing is that uh, right now the atmosphere for export is very conducive uh, if we are a quality producer if we can uh, stick to our commitments then i am sure that you know uh, indian producers can get good export orders those of the buyers who want to diversify their source of supply from china are also looking to india to be at least one source not to that extent but even if we get you know 10% of the orders what they place in china i think that should be good enough for many of our industry and uh, for our msme sector also export is very very important and here i think government has to do some sectoral intervention especially for msme their credit requirement government has given credit guarantee for uh, msme but probably that is more for healthy as msme they they can manage their uh, you know finances in any case without that special support from banks the problem is of not so healthy msme who are under stress what what do we do about them so that is one area where sectoral intervention of the government can make a lot of difference but i think things have started looking up in area like gems and jewelry exports textile exports and another big area of opportunity for us can be agri exports now you know we have so much of stock of food grain at least two food grains rice and wheat international prices are good Which is, so it is viable. Why government should really keep stocks beyond the limits they have set in for safe storage of foods? So I think there, there are lots of opportunity in agri exports, which as a nation we can tap. So on the whole, I feel that things are putting working in place. Uh, they they can be uh, things can be better. if the government intervention is there uh, to ensure proper execution especially of the projects don't get delayed and if we put money in infrastructure like rail road ports now see with little spurt in export we are finding it that uh, our ports are choked so come to think of it if our economy really takes off within 2 3 years then we will have shortage of everything we will have shortage of steel we will have shortage of cement we have shortage of port uh, space but then the private sector investment will come when there is a demand and for that demand to come i think we, if we invest in this infrastructure basic infrastructure then it can make our economy very efficient our logistic cost is 14% as compared to world average of 7 to 8% if we have efficient rail network good ports good uh, road network surely it can come down and make our overall uh, 
competitiveness on a long term basis uh, you know got so these are the interventions i think it has to be a combined effort of government and private industry thank you so much now mr runka i will come back to economy and institution building nation building but let me ask you about life lessons you brought up a family uh, your son and daughter are doing well uh, you've done well you're very active give us some life lessons give us some principles by which you operated that can help other leaders excel in all areas of life not just work but in personal life in professional life in public life so give us what your top three life lessons are so i can tell you that some of my life lessons i learned from my father you know my father was not very highly educated from the point of, of formal education and we had a big family you know we were eight brothers i am last but one you know seven and one sister so we had we were nine siblings and uh, we were in different uh, you know professions mostly in government jobs or public sector jobs so my father told us two things one is that he said ki beta zindagi mein agar kisi ka bhala ho sake to zarur karna agar bhala nahi ho sakta to tum apna bhala kar lena lekin jaan bujh ke kisi ka bhi bura mat kar and you know this is a lesson which he gave to all of us and i have uh, tried to follow it to the best extent possible if i if we can really help others let us try and help others i'll help myself but i will not uh, you know do anything wrong to anybody knowingly and knowingly things can happen you know secondly he told us that you know like the five fingers are not same so you will not have you know same kind of wealth so in life you remember that uh, you have no share in each other's wealth but you have 100% share in each other's name and fame so if your your uh, one brother's name goes up all eight of you will be beneficiary and if one brother's name goes in mud then it will really you know come on you as well so be happy with your own finances and work for each other's glory and name and fame very 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 important lessons and uh, you know with a deep meaning and uh, you know my approach in life has been that if you are sincere then uh, you know so many environment god everywhere everything starts falling in your place you know just an example i was talking when i went to mumbai then my you know son was in terminal year my daughter was in class 12 they said we don't want to stay in delhi alone so my daughter changed uh, you know board she went to maharashtra board in class 12 she they accompanied me and she wanted to go to medical now you know at that time in maharashtra which i learned later that maharashtra there were no pmt you know there was based upon plus 2 results and she got into medical because you know psu and government employees on transfer but treated domicile so she was treated maharashtra domicile and got into medical so you know if you have best of intentions then circumstances god environment you know will conspire to help you and if you have bad intentions then something or the other will happen to you in spite of trying best so i have done everything With the best of intentions i feel that uh, if you try and uh, you know help people then obviously it will come back to you in some way or the other and best way is to help them professionally because that is everlasting you know extending some kind of personal help is one time affair chinese the chinese i was saying for that chinese <laughs> said don't give a fish to a person teach them how to fish so that yeah. they can live, live their life so, on so that's on what that. i to do i don't say that i have perfectly done it but my intention has always been that and uh, i must say that god has been kind my children are, uh, are doing fine and uh, well i am at this stage i am enjoying the company of my grandchildren that's a great bliss for me fantastic now my last question and i'll take some comments and question my last question is to you is that if you had to like look at uh, 
the economy and the country 12 to 24 months from now i'm not looking at 5 years 10 years of course there's no question that india will do well what are your predictions for the industry and economy for the next 12 to 24 months i think we are already on recovery path in the economy you know experts have pointed out you know they have given their growth estimates varying from 9 10% to 11% they keep on revising depending upon the situation but i am an optimist i feel that industry will do well especially uh, on the back of i think some momentum in exports we can see that first time you know in this quarter our exports are higher than 40% higher than fy 19 20 exports so that means we, we are working on a higher base and we still have uh, nine months to go you know in the financial year as far as export so export can be one philip agri economy i said can be another philip and i am optimistic that uh, we should be able to achieve a 10% growth uh, in this year which will bring us uh, not exactly at par with the but it will be sort of 1920 level and thereafter we can grow so i i see that some of the industries uh, will be doing very well where there is consolidation where they have taken a lot of internal actions to bring in cost competitiveness to be nimble and product you know raise their productivity they are today competitive in exports uh, many of these industries will do well their profitability will rise and wherever demand is rising i think they are already thinking of fresh investment like steel industry is already talking of fresh investment uh, because their balance sheets are getting stronger so our balance sheets of many other industries in different sectors are getting stronger so i see that uh, there no looking back i think government also means business but more than government i think, i suppose uh, overall basis uh, the only issue which every time it is talked about is demand uh, once uh, i think if we are uh, we are able to leave corona behind i personally feel that there will be a big explosion in domestic tourism you know it is not going to be easy for indians to really travel abroad even in post corona and but they they will be really going to every nook and corner of the country on domestic tourism and uh, domestic tourism is a good multiplier for you know economic activity so i am optimistic 24 months from now we will be firmly on a, a growth trajectory i thought easily 6 to 7 6 to 7% of annualized growth that is what is my assessment and i hope i am proved right so i said last but i'll ask you with your long career with your track record with your experience is there any way you'd like to serve the country i know you serve on many uh, boards you serve on non profit boards you counsel entrepreneurs Uh, we do in this conversation you write a lot but beyond that you know uh, would you formally like to associate with some causes now that uh, you have the time and the inclination to be able to contribute uh, and to causes that are close to your heart oh yes certainly i know whatever way because i am uh, physically active and you know the best way to keep yourself physically fit is to you know remain engaged so Uh, well i am not on a full time role so of course i am sitting on the uh, boards of uh, 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 some companies but nevertheless i can find time for other activities as well uh, one thing which is close to my heart is you know psu reform cpsc and i had headed a you know high powered panel uh, you know which gave recommendation on uh, you know reforms in central public sector enterprises they were wide ranging uh, recommendations very important ones so, you know they were not comprehensively dealt at one time government had constituted a group of ministers to deal with this report and there was a public announcement from uh, you know sort of vigyan bhavan platform that you know we are going to implement the rungta committee report but somehow it didn't happen but nevertheless in bits and pieces government have done it even uh, now i keep reading report that uh, rungta panel recommendations are still relevant like you know there was a suggestion that you know government should remain only in the strategic sectors 
and rest they should uh, disinvest and uh, finally government has come out with that policy that only in designated strategic sectors they will have only two psus and rest they will uh, disinvest of course there will be a road map for that so in any way i can uh, contribute for you know greater efficiency of uh, you know public sector for enhancing their uh, worth and value for for government to realize higher uh, sort of value as and when they disinvest because i think some of the uh, public sector are not commanding their intrinsic value they have huge huge uh, infrastructure with them uh, they have very very trained man power i can tell you that i have seen the private sector also and the, the talent is still available with psu is unmatched no private sector can match them so in whatever manner i can be of assistance to the country for uh, you know enhancing the value of our psu i suppose that is one subject close to my heart and i can certainly whatever contribution i can make i am too glad to do that thank you so much there are lots of comments i'll take some of them share them with you uh, the people who possibly know you uh mr sk goel says very pragmatic and effective answers to the question of national concern thanks a lot mr rungta for telling us real situation dear during covid wonderful insights leader arna goel sir sir you're speaking really well your words are very inspiring thank you for sharing your insights in insights shiv shankar bagaria says sir your views are very helpful to all heads of management we learn good ideas from you by sharing your knowledge with us Ruchika Naval says very insightful and inspiring point. There is a question and a comment from Mr. R. Murli Dharan. He says days of steel will be soon over. Artificial intelligence and nano materials like graphene will take over. Do you think India is prepared for this disruption in materials? Well, I suppose a, lo- a lot of uh, research is going on and uh, some progress has been made with regard to graphene and nano materials. Uh, certainly it can be taken as a you know material of future but i don't think so in a wholesale manner it can replace the steel certainly for certain applications graphene and nano materials will, will come and uh, indian steel industry is globally competitive they have the technology which is best uh, you know globally and uh, surely they should be able to respond to that situation so i well uh, agreeing with mr murli dharan that yes a graphene or nano material can really uh, you know move forward and uh, can scale up i don't think so that in a wholesale manner they will be able to replace the steel steel will be there to stay and uh, graphene will also have its uh, role for certain application to that extent i suppose steel industry should prepare itself thank you so much mr rungta that was mr sk rungta former chairman of sale we can call him the steel man of india or the metal man of india he has been on many boards uh, he has represented india abroad uh, thank you for talking to us mr rungta your words of wisdom your inputs on the way forward both in terms of economy and institution building your inputs on psu reforms i think the government and the policy makers can certainly benefit from your insights and your experience and your uh, hands on expertise of understanding how uh, the partnership between government and private sector can happen so clearly uh, it was a i would say a master class for people who joined in uh, i'm sure uh, we all have benefited from your inputs and thank you for being a nation builder in the true sense uh, for those of you who uh, could not watch it fully you can watch it on the youtube channel of bw business world or read it on businessworld.in on monday the full text of the interview or Uh, read it in the next issue of BW Business World magazine. Next Saturday, we'll be back with the third episode of the Nation Builders, and we'll be talking to Dr. R. A. Mashelkar, who again doesn't really need any introduction. Uh, he's been the Director General of the CSIR. He's a Padma Award winner. He's an author. He runs the Anjani Mashelkar Foundation, and he wants India to be a superpower using scientific temperament. So we'll be back next Saturday at 6 p.m. and we'll be talking to dr r a mashelkar uh, and i'd like to express my gratitude to dr uh, sk rungta for joining today thank you mr rungta we wish you luck and we look forward to your inputs being utilized and i'm sure a lot of people have been inspired by the work you've done in nation building and institution building thank you so much